here we go. So this morning we have Graham Watt um, and you might know or remember Graham from uh, being the director of Witches. Um, our first speakers when I started were uh, Stephen and Matthew who um, delighted us with the story of how Witches came about um, and it's amazing that we're going to get to see your perception. <laughs> so Graham, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And My you're, pleasure. You're uh, from Cumberland and still based in Cumberland, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how how does Widges find you? Like, where um, what's been your path before that, and at what point did that? I think it came from Stephen. Um, did that crash into your life? <laughs> well, um, so I my background, uh, if you can call it that, is in music. I was in uh, a band, and uh, that pretty much was something that I devoted my um, entire time to uh, when that was going on. But when that started to, to cool down, uh, we'd spent quite a bit of money on it. We'd done like four self-financed tours of the States um, and we were all friends in the band and we were barely friends by the time that finished. Okay. So we just went on like an extended hiatus. The singer went on to have some kids and uh, that gave me um, a lot more free time than I normally would have. Um, but I still had that creative urge. And um, I ended up, um, well, this was around about the time that I had my first sort of digital camera. It was just like a, a camcorder that we had, you know, belonged to the family. And um, up to that point, I had done quite a bit of documenting of the band's trips to the States had made like a small mini documentary, that sort of thing. And I'd made some small sort of amateur music videos and just little funny videos, that kind of thing. And it was about that time that I got um, my first DSLR. And uh, I just wanted to make stuff. I was watching a lot of YouTube um, tutorials and stuff like that. It was uh, Film Riot um, had just started then. Film Riot, if anyone doesn't know, is a very popular um, instructional series on a, a filmmaking and this is just around about the time what 2009 2010 which dslr filmmaking had pretty much you know it was at its early peak so me and a bunch of other friends like people from the the music scene like you'd be surprised how many people in the music scene are just frustrated actors and i would pop i would i would start making short films like there used to be a time where i would ask for permission and um, from people like it's very very common that you feel that you have to ask for permission to do something it's almost like can i be creative can i think outside the box can i do something that's outside the norm can i go and make films and then put them on youtube it's like why are you asking permission if you want to do it just do it so i just got all of the willing people um that i could find to be involved in any way shape or form whether it be behind the camera in front of the camera and then we set about starting to make short films and initially the the idea was to try and get them out as quickly as possible so you would write shoot edit and release them within two weeks and that model lasted about four weeks um, before the film started to get more and more ambitious because you would start you would start off something simple like my very first film was a just a funny film about a guy who his toaster breaks down and it's called toaster um, and it's like a little sort of comedy horror film where the toaster that he buys to um replace his defective toaster angers his original toaster and basically the, the original toaster tries to kill him in a series of bizarre events um and then from that it just you know it got progressively bigger and then you know you're wanting to see the things that you see in films um you know you want to recreate them so like you start to ask yourself well why can't i have a 10 minute monologue in the middle of a short film <laughs> like the guy like, like in jaws when you know quint's talking about um you know the, that whole shark story and all the sharks eating all the sailors after that shipwreck and i thought why can't we have that in a short film um but it just got progressively more ambitious until we were actually spending upwards of seven months on some films. Um, we were also doing, uh, we started doing commercial filmmaking at that point in terms of like, you know, filming gigs, that kind of thing. Um, but the fact that I owned the camera, the fact that I, I did make these short films, 
that was enough for a friend of mine who I worked with in an office job at a call centre actually to recommend me to Stephen and George at the time. Uh, Matthew wasn't on the scene. Um, Stephen and George, the lead actors from Ouija's. And uh, Stephen had written a script, a pilot script, and a mutual friend um, basically hooked us up. We met in Costa one day. And then within three weeks, we were filming the first pilot for Ouija's, which no one, no, you, you haven't seen Maureen and no one else will ever see again. Um, that was our first attempt at it. And we actually did quite well with that. We filmed it in one week, yeah. took a few weeks to do post-production on it. They had already organised all of the um, the locations and stuff like that. So I just basically had to buy the extra equipment, um, you know, just bring in my own people to work behind the camera, just friends that had worked on the short films with me. And eventually um, we released it and we actually had a premiere at the ABC in Sucky Hall Street, mm -hmm. which we managed to sell out. And it was a lovely event, but nothing, um, it was a big buzz, but nothing really came of it. And then it was a few... Um, I became really good friends with those guys and we kept in touch and about three, four years later we got back together and decided to do it right but by that time I'd been I had a few more connections and when I say connections it's just people that I know that are trying to make their way in the industry young up and comers um, people that were willing to just get the experience and whatnot but they also had a great deal of savvy when it comes to actually the art of filmmaking like our eventual director of photography on Ouija's um Michael Neal he was only 19 at the time but he had a tremendous eye for um you know cinematography he, he just knew I know it sounds simplistic but he just knew what to put the camera and what to do with it he really was a big big fan of cameras and uh, he brought uh, someone else in and you know before he even knew it it was just we were getting put in contact with, our, with our, our, our sound guy who eventually ended up being a sound guy. I had met somebody else at that point who was a jack of all trades with everything. And we actually had a pretty um, efficient, uh, well-oiled machine of a team. And uh, we, but because everyone who had, I'd brought in had that sort of eye, that sort of drive, that sort of desire to do not just the bare minimum, but make it look like I've always said like all the short films that I've done I've always been trying to do the very best I possibly can because I want to be happy with it myself I don't want to just put it something that you know I'll, that'll impress somebody it has to impress me so you're always trying to achieve more you're always trying to impress yourself you're always saying okay that's not good enough we need to do more and uh, thankfully the people that I brought in they were kind of like that as well and uh, so instead of doing Ouija's like bare minimum, you know, just begging and borrowing and stealing. I mean, there was an element of that, but we decided to go down the Kickstarter route. And um, we got a decent amount of money and that plus the the drive and the attention to detail and the, you know, the determination to do well, uh, not just to do well, but to do very well, um, to do it right, uh, led to us working on Ouija's for nearly four years. Um, and I think that maybe includes post-production time. But in that four years, because when you start it off, you think to yourself that you're making something to pitch to a TV company. There, you get no idea at that point that Amazon Prime is going to end up being as big as it, it was. I mean, I think because of the pandemic, Amazon Prime um, is a lot bigger than it was before because, you know, pretty much everybody in the country has it. And, um, you know, we were able to get it on to Amazon. But, you know, having something to aim for like that gave us the drive to not just do Ouija's well um, while we're filming it, but also in the post-production side of things, which it basically took like um, a really concerted effort to get it into a condition that was suitable enough for broadcast. So we did the sound as good as we could do it. We had a professional colour grader. Um, Nothing went into it that wasn't, you know, of what we thought the highest standard it could be. And, you know, we ended up getting it on, going at, getting it on Amazon, so. Wow, I mean, that's amazing. And I, I love the fact that you mentioned that you did a first attempt at it with a pilot and that, you know, three, four years later, like you sort of rebanded together and sort of like, you know, decided to do like what you thought was right. Um, because I think sometimes we can really, 
when, when all we see is the finished product, it's kind of easy to, you know, people say like, you know, overnight success and, you know, like just the creative process is just like, poof. but it is a process. And sometimes the process can go, you know, can span over like a decade or, like, you know, several years at least. Um, so thanks yeah. for saying that. Yeah. Um, I think I saw a bit of, is there anything from the pilot on YouTube? Because I think I, I saw some things on YouTube. Um, we have like, so the, around about the pilot to promote the pilot, we did about five short films ah. and those are not actually available online anymore either. So it's not them that you've seen, but um, oh, really? and, 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 and the run up to releasing the series, we released um, uh, a couple of short episodes that were of the same standard that were filmed in the exact same way and to the same standard as the series itself and obviously quicker turnaround because there were short sketches mm -hmm. um, and we tried to get these short sketches you know um, onto short sketch uh, platforms like BBC Social and whatnot but we were repeatedly turned down because we were told that it looks like something from a bigger series you know it's not standalone enough but it kind of flies in the face of what stuff that we'd already seen because there's plenty of stuff that I've seen on there that does actually look like it comes from an already established property, like it could be part of another series, whatever. But we had made these shorts um, standalone enough to be, you know, considered yeah. just standalone pieces, like people who wouldn't need any sort of. So we, we were quite successful with it, we had an awful lot of views. Uh, so there's about three of them um, in the run up to the actual series release so yeah that that would have been what you've seen so also the way sort of you came to filmmaking and it was very sort of self-taught and you know sort of um just learning the skills that you needed to sort of complete your your short films and um so with witches how far i mean i, I get the feeling that you were involved throughout like throughout the whole production post-production as well yep um did you edit the series or did you guys do you get an editor in and like how how did it most work for you? The editing um, was done, the majority of it was done by me and our, I, I took a lot of, um, I deferred in a lot of ways to the director of photography uh, with regards to pacing, uh, choice of shots, that sort of thing. So I would, I would basically do an assembly and then the two of us would work together to fine tune it. And then, you know, the other guys would come in and uh, they would obviously have their two cents on as to how it would be, uh, you know, best. But, you know, one of the things that I believe that a director should be able to do is, um, you know, the directors, although someone's written the script and, you know, they are, the, the, the writers have kind of a vision, you know, it's the director's job to translate that from the page to the screen. And I think, you know, as a director, you need to be able to kind of put your foot down a little bit and say, no, I think it should be this way. But at the same time, without being stubborn, you know, you take um, uh, other people's views into consideration and stuff like that. And you try and come up with like the best sort of, it's not even like a compromise because there's nothing in there that I actually compromised on. Mm -hmm. Like it just everything, we all agreed that the way it was, was the way it was. So um, we couldn't have afforded to bring in an editor anyway, but you know, um, and I have learned over the years to delegate a lot more because it comes to the point you just get so busy that you can't have a hand in anything. And with everything I do at the moment, I'm kind of hoping that I can get to more of a supervisory role because there's a lot of times when you need, it's better for, I think there's a lot of times, it's good for the director to be involved in the edit, but typically that's not the way it works. Usually you would have, you know, an editor uh, who would take charge of that process because it's better to have someone edit it that wasn't involved in directing it because I think there's an element of you can be as a director a little bit or even as a writer you can be too precious um, it's, uh -huh. you, you, and it's also like you know they say the film is made three times when you write it when you shoot it and when you edit it yeah um and and that's yeah that's all yeah. it's very exciting to me because see the whole process like I find that a lot of things inform this first of all the, the story informs like you know how it's going to go we had to pick a style we had to kind of we kind of I think I'd never seen it at the time but like you know one of the things that Michael brought to the table was like he was very aware a big a big a big for Stephen's point of view uh a big influence was the like say Gavin and Stacey and still game and stuff like that um Michael and I 
uh, I, Michael had said, or the, the photography had basically said that, you know, it, it seems like it needs like a sort of French meat kind of vibe. If you've ever seen that show, I, I hadn't seen it, but um, we, we kind of settled on a style very quickly. I mean, the script kind of informs the style, um, but once you get into the editing stage, and because we were editing it over the course of like, as we were shooting it. So basically if you're shooting it over four years and you're not waiting to the end of that four years to edit it, you're actually editing it as you go. So things like discovering the soundtrack, that informs the edit. Um, it tells you, sometimes a story just tells you what it wants to be or, or how it wants to be put across. And the music can play a big part of that. So once you've actually found the voice of the show, then you just basically, you edit to that. You, everything gets put together um, according to that vibe. You know, it's yeah. like if, if you already had an established property, like for instance, if you wanted to make another, um, I'll go more modern, I wouldn't say something like Friends, whatever, because I don't think that would really work today. But um, if you wanted to make, for instance, Gavin and Stacey, that Christmas um, episode that came out recently, and that was after so many years since the series finished, you've got an established property and that there's only really one way to make that show. So you just, you, you, the benefit of working on it for such a long time is just that you kind of know what it, the end product is going to look like because um, everything that you've used to make the previous scenes, like, you know, you've already had some music in mind, some music in place, whatnot, you have your style, you have your beats, your pace and all that stuff. Um, when it comes time to putting everything together, you're just... You're, you're you're basically trying to fit it into that 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 box mm -hmm. that that sounds you know negative but oh I, I think i totally see what you mean the um, it, once you find the theme once you find as you said i love how you just put it how you find now when you find the voice of the show everything all the creative choices feed into that and makes it stronger that makes sense um the other thing that I wanted to explore with you is the fact that um, we've established you're a creative polymath and you do, you know, you put your hands in everything, everything that you can find out to make sure that you get a grip on it and, and explore your creativity. And that's something I really like about you. Um, one thing that, uh, the, the one scene that really stuck with me from Witches was um, the when they're on the set and they're actually getting to be actors, <laughs> which, you know, throughout the series is where they want to be. Um, and they're actually on the set of, is it a World War II film? Mm -hmm. um, and you see, it's not a Spitfighter, it's, is it? Um, the, um, so it's, a, it's a German plane, like a, a German ah, fighter plane. Um, so, and I was like, I remember thinking, oh, <laughs> how did they do that? <laughs> um, so, Graham, how did you do it? <laughs> Well, as soon as I saw the script, I saw that they, it was just, they were in a, a war film, but this scene as originally written was just like, there's two guys dressed as soldiers and then two other guys come out of the bushes and then they're immediately shot. The idea is, you know, that the main characters in it, they're really struggling to be actors, but they're just background people. Essentially, it's like, you know, they get a, a part in a war film and they're killed instantly. Like they have one second of combined screen time. And I thought, it's a good op opportunity there to expand that and actually, you know, have, um, I mean, I know it's been done before with extras, but like we tried to put like a different spin on it uh, and extras, they actually have scenes, it's intercut with scenes from the actual movie. So anyone that doesn't know extras, you know, it's about background extras, they work on these film sets and they have, you know, guest stars and um, the TV series is intercut with actual scenes from the finished movie that they happen to be um, in. So I thought it was a good opportunity to do that. So we did it in widescreen. Um, wanted to do it like Saving Private Ryan. So I built a miniature French village, um, like a, a bombed French village with rubble everywhere. And that took a few months to make, but Again, you had the luxury of, you know, the series when you was going to take about three or four years. Um, I don't think we thought it was going to take three or four years when we first started it, but it's just so difficult to that get that number of people together, um, especially people as the years went on, these people who were very talented started to get more work in the industry. So getting a, a large crew and cast together took 
it's quite a logistical nightmare, but somehow we managed it because we were so determined. So during the time that I was making that, it gave me time to construct a miniature French village in 124 scale. So your buildings are like this high. Um, and it's the first time that I'd ever done anything like that. And I'm literally just trying to make it look like what I see on the screen. You know, a bit of trial and error, but thankfully, um, I just have a kind of building style where, and this is a style that I kind of have with everything really, is I just start messing with it until it becomes something. And I think that's the way I was with filmmaking as well. Like I wouldn't spend hours watching the YouTube videos. I would watch the first five minutes of the YouTube video. And as soon as I would get an idea, it's like, I've got to try that. Whereas I've got friends who will sit there and study the YouTube videos and the tutorials and stuff like that. Whereas I'm just, I want to get in there and I want to see how it works straight away. So it's like, it's almost like, you know, just not bothering with the instruction manual, just figure out how to do it yourself. Mm. But trial and error, um, you can see, like, the, the worst thing you can worry about is making a mistake because you're going to make mistakes. I built a space station for a science fiction film once and my space station went through four incarnations. Like, it was floppy on the first attempt. Bits were breaking off on the second attempt. And eventually I got it sturdy and, you know, I got all the details and everything. I thought, oh, those details are too big. I need to take them off and make them smaller. So you're just progressively learning and you're realising, you know, what coffee pot looks like part of a space station, you know, and, and what one doesn't, you know. <laughs> um, so the same with the village. I built it over the course of time. I had to find a place to store it. Then I had to find a place to shoot it. So we actually did that up in St Andrews. And I also had to get a realistic looking plane. So I found the biggest scale miniature plane that I could, because obviously the bigger the size scale, the you know, the, the bigger sense of scale you've got, the little ones just you would you would be able to tell it was a miniature, especially if you're shooting it from close up. So I had to buy and build that. I wasn't much of a painter, so I employed a model painter who got a real kick out of you know making the designs really realistic. Um and then finally over the course of those years, we was able to find time to, it took one day to shoot the miniature. And we just basically did it in a field in St. Andrews and made the earth around it all, uh, you know, look small enough and just got the lighting right and gave it forced perspective. So there was actual background from a field in it. And it, it looked, you know, quite realistic. And at one point, two large tractors um, who were plowing the field drove past and, I wish I'd actually got that in film because they were towering above this little village. Um, and then the plane, I had to, I don't have any, when you're filming miniatures, especially if you want to film moving miniatures, um, you need usually what's called a motion control rig, motion control camera. So typically you're getting a programmed camera on a, on a jib to move past the phone. You don't move the model because the move model is too fragile. The camera moves past it. And then sometimes you have that in front of a blue screen. Sometimes you have it in front of a green screen. It's quite, model making is quite an intense operation and it's very time consuming. So what I had to do was set the, um, uh, the plane up on a tripod with clouds in the background and then put my camera on a Ronin gimbal and just move past it 20, 30 times until I got something that looked like an organic movement because sometimes you can walk past it and there's too much camera shake and it's a bit janky but basically I'm trying to recreate the look and I've checked the, the camera after every pass so I'm doing it 20 30 times just to get one movement of, of a plane that looks like it's flying past or like it's a, you know it's like you know it's coming it's, it's like this and it's been off at like that. And that's just me walking past with a camera on a, on a jig, jib, sorry. And um, it's just trial and error. And it's just knowing what you think looks right. Um, and if you don't get it, you go back again and try and get it again. And it's all for just a few seconds of footage. But if you can pull it off, you sit, it's the sort of thing you just sit, about, sit up at night, like thinking about, dreaming about, you know, it's just like, I really want that to happen. I really want that shot. And when, it, and when you actually manage to pull it off, it's so worth it. And the ironic thing is as well, you're hoping that no one will notice that it's actually a miniature because you want it to look real. So on one hand, you're wanting someone to say, oh, that's really good miniature work. But in, what you're really hoping is that they don't notice. Um, there's so many scenes in so many movies where you would never have a clue what you're looking at is an actual miniature um, or a replaced background or something like that because 
we just did a music video recently, uh, which is going to be released on the 4th of February for a, a Gaelic band. And that is a historical music video set uh, in the late 1800s. And we spent months building um, a little um, uh, old Highland cottage. And when we gave it to the colour grader, he got to the credits and saw miniature work by, and he, he asked us, was there a miniature on that? So, and that's what you're looking for. You know, if someone doesn't notice you've done your job right, I always say, um, it's like a bassist. Yeah, you know that a bass player is doing a really good job when he doesn't stand out, you know? I mean, I know that there's obviously a, a, a moments where a bass player would, but like if a bass player is really doing his job and it's like he's holding that that groove together, you know, um, that that's that's when you know he's a, 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 a he or she's a really good bassist. I love that, absolutely. I mean, isn't that just... Um just everything about filmmaking is about making sure that people don't realize that they're watching a movie and you know that they're really engrossed in the universe of the film. I love that, absolutely. And I think the best thing about it is it's just like, it elevates what you do. It's the reason why you do it is because you want to create something that gives other people the same thrill or gives you the same thrill that you get when you're sitting in the cinema. Okay. Uh, you, you want to tell a story and um, you want to get an emotional, response to to me it's all about that that connection to something that the way a film the way a tv show makes you feel mm. is it's not just entertainment to me it's almost spiritual <laughs> i love that absolutely well anything creative sort of yeah elevates your experience to something more than just what you are yeah. <laughs> but um so is there anyone out there who sort of you look up to or who inspires you or do you just sort of keep your head down and do your own thing and just keep pushing until like do you forge your own path which i get that you do but is there anyone out there who sort of you'd like to emulate or who inspires you with with the scope of projects that they do yeah uh, obviously growing up um uh, i was a big fan of spielberg um and the way those films uh make you feel um obviously big fan of star wars and stuff like that um but yeah it's no it's no one particular person that's the funny thing about it i can't really say that you know i just i'm really inspired by people who are just all about the art they're all about the the thrill of doing it you know it's something that you can't imagine them doing anything else um i mean what spielberg did um basically jumping off a tour bus at Universal when he was a young boy and just not leaving. That's how he got his start. He just found an empty office and then just started shadowing every member of the film crew until he knew that business inside out. Um, that takes a real special kind of commitment and crazy. Um, and I don't think <laughs> I could do that. You know, I'll do it to an extent, but at the same time, it's just like he... The, the sort of person that says, I can't imagine doing anything else. I'm not really like that. I'm more the sort of thing where, you know, I wake up in the morning and I say, yeah, I can't imagine doing anything else. But, you know, if I had to, I would, um, you know, it, it, it's just, it fits. I wake up in the morning and I still have the same desire to do it that I did the night before. So um, I don't know if there's any one person that would really inspire me. It's the work that, that I'm inspired by. Um, the most i don't really think i have any heroes or anything like that um there's people i admire and whatnot but you know it's, you think of yourself a lot of your heroes like especially filmmakers like they kind of lose their touch after a while so like everybody would probably have said at one point that quentin tarantino was you know untouchable and could do no wrong but you know um i think even he knows that that's not the case because that's why he said he would only do 10 movies because you don't want to become irrelevant. And even Spielberg, I think his last great movie was probably Catch Me If You Can. Mm. Um, and, you know, after that, it's just like, he's just a safe pair of hands, you know? Yeah. Um, but then you look back at some of the stuff that people have done where it's just like, it's lightning in a bottle. Mm -hmm. No matter what people might say about George Lucas, Star Wars changed the world. Yeah. 
you know, and nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Mm. Um, you know, I just, I think Ricky Gervais, just to go further into the, the spectrum, his first two shows, Office and Extras, like, it doesn't matter what he does for the rest of his life. He could release Afterlife or a million other TV shows. Nothing will ever be as good as those two shows. Mm. That's my opinion anyway. But I just think that, you know, if someone can do something that makes an impact, you know, I just, I, I really like that everybody who's in the creative space has an opportunity to at least do one thing that, you know, they can look back at and say, that's the best thing that I've ever done. You know, I'm really happy with that. I, it doesn't matter if I, I can just, you know, sort of plod along and just enjoy myself now. I don't need to keep topping myself and mm -hmm. uh, doing better than before, you know. Um, that is something that's, you know, I can be, I can be really proud of that. I did my best there. Amazing, and I love the idea also of just like it's one big craft and one big industry, and and everyone it's the endeavor more than the person, and you're trying to really bring something special, and once you've done that, then you validated everything, and yeah, yeah. Um, so at what point do you start um, lending live studio? So you have your own um, your own outfit, if you like, like. Your own I think I think I think Andrew is looking to say something there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just almost a sick question. When you're going out to film, how tied are you to your short list? Uh, and how flexible are you in terms of, oh, I'll come in with that idea, but here's a better one and just do it? Um, what short list? Well, <laughs> no, no, I'm not joking. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we. Have to, you have to do a short list simply because of the fact that there's just so much with the best of intentions you're going to miss things and you don't want to get back to the editing suite and realise that you've you know you're it's without something that, that, that doesn't you know you, you've got a shot that makes the whole scene unravel um, very 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 much um, open to workshopping things on set if we have the time if something doesn't hit I mean I'm very they say that you should probably just keep it to yourself or you should, you know, should, shouldn't betray your true feelings when you're like, you know, in a position like that. But speaking of Spielberg again, uh, I, I, bring, I, I roll this one out all the time. I think it was David Lean, the director of Lawrence of Arabia, that said to Spielberg, he says, there's going to be times on set that you're not going to know where the scene's going to go, what you're doing. Words to that effect, there's going to be times where you're not going to have a clue what to do next. And he said, you have to guard that secret with your life. So, There'll be times when I'll say, let's try it another way. But there'll also be times where it's like, I don't know how to make this scene better, you know, mm -hmm. for some reason it's just like it's there, but it's not really, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not really um doing anything for me, you know. It probably would do something for someone else, but you know, ideally you're wanting to like have every shot, every scene that you get, you're going to be wanting to say, Yeah, no, I'm happy with that. And then obviously, like very happy with it, where you know, I'm very vocal with regards to that. So people can always tell when I'm happy with a shot because I'll be very expressive about it. I'll get really excited. You know, that's the sort of thing where I'm just like clapping my hands, you know, just really excited. But you have to give the actors the freedom to express themselves. Um, if you can laugh at it, then basically that's half the battle because I wouldn't like to put anything out that I wasn't happy with or I didn't laugh at. Um, there's going to be some things that are just not going to agree with my sense of humour and going to just going to agree with other people's. So I, I admit that, but, you know, we very, very open to going off, um, not just off, off shot list, but off, off, uh, you have, there's the things that you have to get, but there's also things we have like, like a, like a sort of in our mind, a list of, must get uh um can get if possible or, or or would be nice you know so you get what you have to get but you get what what would be, what would be nice you know there's stuff that you absolutely have to get otherwise the scene won't work and um, there's stuff that you can get if you have time uh, and then there's stuff that is just like let's try this if we have a little bit of extra time you know something like get adventurous maybe try it from a different angle try and get one of those magic shots that you know, you think you don't include in the ship short list because you know that it's going to be a time sucker. Um, uh, yeah. what, I, mean, 
I, I've just always found that, you know, you go out with a short list and you're halfway into it and you go, oh, that would be an idea. <laughs> and suddenly, half an hour after that, you're still doing the other idea. And you're going, yeah. where are we in the short list? <laughs> yeah, very much so. And that's where it really, really benefits from having a good AD. A good first AD is the sort of person that will basically tell you what you can have and tell you what you can't have, more importantly. Because um, you know, I had a good few um, back and forth with ADs in the past. Mm-hmm. Because you're determined um, that you, you want to get your idea across, but at the same time, the AD's job is to make sure that the stay on track. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, if if it, it, it also helps you consider in your mind, is this really something? that I need, you know, and it makes you realise how much you want it. And if I want it to continue, I want it enough to, to actually continue the fight, um, then that's usually a good sign. Um, but yeah, it, you have to have that flexibility in a situation like that, because although there's time involved, although there's money involved, although, you know, um, you just might not have the scope to be able to do everything that you want to do. Um, I've heard it said before, and it's not my quote, but I say it all the time. It's like you have you have to be allowed to fail. Um, you know, so just because some someone can be like, oh, I really want to do this, I really want to do this, then they do it and it falls flat, and they're going, okay, fine, um, it didn't work. But sometimes you have to try something to know whether or not it's going to work. You have to be allowed to fail. The, 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 the phrase is really, in my opinion, create, real creativity can't exist in, uh, in an environment where failure isn't allowed. Um, so yeah, yeah. That was an amazing question. Thank you, Andrew. So, um, so then you have your own um, production outfit where, um, you know, your studio where you build all your miniatures and, and explore sort of uh, what well, you work out of, really. Um, yeah. But at what point did you set that up? Was that, did you, did you have that before witches or is that something that sort of grew organically out of having witches? Out of no, all, all the editing was done in either my house or someone else's house. Uh, we didn't have a base of operations at all. And um, that was a real source of frustration. Um, on one hand, you can get a lot done when you're in the house because you can put in late hours and like you know your bed is just in the next room or whatever. But having a place to go where you can be in a completely creative space where it's separate from your home life and you can have no interruptions if you want and you have everything you need on the one space. The most frustrating thing of all this, and this is how you know you really, really want it, is, you know, do you still have the enthusiasm for it when you have to pack away all the gear at the end of the night and then probably take it to another place before you can even get home? Um, but having the studio now, which we've had since November 2020, um, that not only gave me an opportunity to get, because I care for elderly parents, so it gave me an opportunity to get out of that headspace you know, I was able to go by myself to the studio, which is like 20 minutes away, you know, even though um, lockdown was in place, like I, I, I still, I had to work from there. Uh, but because I was there by myself, you know, I could do that. I had that, that ability to, be, to, to get out and go to work in a completely creative space. And that really sort of saved my, I always, I always say saved my life, but it, it, it helped a great deal because first lockdown was really difficult for me because I didn't, for, because I had elderly parents, I didn't set foot in another building for four straight months. You know what I mean? Like the own, and I, this was the same experience for a lot of people. The only time you actually got out was, you know, to get out for your hour um, around Cumbernauld. And if anyone knows what it's like to only walk around Cumbernauld um, every day of your life for four months, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they can relate but yeah um, we've been in there since November 2020 um, slowly but surely building things up getting the website together just sort of taking uh, word of mouth jobs um, we do animations we do miniature work I've uh, done, anima- done miniature work for an upcoming virtual reality fringe show where a guy actually 
sorry, augmented reality actually combines digital augmented reality, like actually putting little animated characters into these physical sets that we build that are about that size. And like, he actually shows them up on screen. This is all done in real time um, and on stage, um, stuff like that. Uh, we do music videos. A lot of people did music videos during the pandemic because, you know, they had existing footage lying around or they needed like an animation done, that sort of thing, something that didn't actually require them to go anywhere or, you know, didn't actually require them to physically be there to, to, to film with. Done a lot of those. Um, but basically the studio is like a small office unit. It's 300 square feet. Um, on one corner, we have an editing suite in music production facilities. And the other corner we have our, uh, all of our gear, camera stuff, sound equipment, lights, all that stuff. And the other corner, we have uh, a workbench where we actually build miniatures and props and stuff like that. Anything from prop guns to, you know, anything that requires like a physical build, we can do that there. And in the other corner, the last remaining corner, we have a very small sound stage, which is just basically a corner of the room with a blank wall and a green screen. And there's a lot that we can do there as well. We can film the miniatures there and we can even film small scenes involving one or two people. Um, the most recent short film that we did was called The Hang, which is on our Land and Light Studios YouTube channel if anyone wants to watch it. But it's basically um, uh, about a guy who phones up his satellite provider because the lassie from the ring is coming out of his TV. And um, that living room set and all the practical effects that we did with her coming out the TV and stuff like that was all done um, in our studio. Um, and we brought in a makeup artist, we brought in a cinematographer, we brought in a, another actress to do it. Um, we had some help with production design. We built flats up against the, the wall covered in wallpaper, just like you would in a studio. So small space, but having somewhere to go to do that stuff where you're just, you know, all your stuff. It's a one-stop shop for filmmaking. So basically we can do everything in there unless we're, you know, we're, um, we require a bigger space, but you can do pretty much anything there. And the best thing is that you can leave everything there. You don't have to take anything home with you. It's like you can go to like midnight or two or three o'clock in the morning and then just leave everything set up and come back in the next day and put it away um, at your leisure. So nobody has to scramble about, you know, rolling up cords, packing away lights, cameras, stuff like that, you know, driving everybody home, driving stuff back to somebody's house so they can take it to a rental house the following day. That's not to be said that we don't, you know, rent stuff. They still do that for like, you know, if we have to do like a corporate job or a commercial uh, video, any sort of business promotional stuff or whatnot, where we need like a photo studio, that sort of stuff. We still have to do that and we still do on site stuff as well. But just having that base to be able to come back to um, and dump the stuff or just leave stuff there is just, it's been an absolute godsend. Um, and even now, when I walk into the studio, I'm so happy to be there because it's like you walk in and it's just like, even if you've got like work to do, you know, you can warm up to that by doing something creative by yourself you know work on one of your own passion projects just to get the sort of creative juices flowing um because although it's a really good job you know having to just suddenly walk from a situation where your home life say for instance you've got stuff where you're caring for people and whatnot and it's a very serious situation to all of a sudden just walk into an environment and to in order to start work you have to basically flick a switch and basically turn on your creativity. It's it's not easy, but having a space that is geared towards that where you walk in and it's like, it just, you can feel it in the air when you walk in. It's just very conducive uh, to being creative. It's a nice relaxed atmosphere and everything is all set up and ready for you to use. So every time I walk in there, it's just it's still a great feeling. Yeah. Anything that can, um... That can trigger that people i remember writers saying you know they always write to the same piece of music because they have like music that just inspires them so anything sort of physical and tangible that can sort of yeah get you yeah i've recorded an album once but in our bassist basically um when we were in the room together like laying down the bed track um he basically put up posters of his favorite band bands and he's in his, in his in his little corner where he was playing the bass and I thought, what are you doing? It's just like, I'm just trying to make the place feel more like home. And I thought, I, I, I get that now, you know? 
Absolutely. Um, so you were saying you were sort of going into animation as well. Is that something? Because animation strikes me as just a very different beast to well, obviously live action. Is that something you got to through that project that was using the miniature and the, and the animated character? Or is that something that just, again, came, was that an opportunity that popped up? And how did that go down? That came about because a band called Bomb Scare, who were uh, who are a ska band, um, they needed a, a, a they were doing a cover of Live and Let Die, um, and they had an album that was a ska a ska album, but it was um, all like sort of the theme of it was kind of uh, James Bond, and uh, they had a cover of Live and Let Die. So we did a uh, if you ever seen Catch Me If You Can, there's an animated intro to that film uh, with little stick figures and silhouettes, and I thought. We know how to do basic animation and after effects so that might be a good thing to do so if anyone wants to check that out that's also on youtube it's called a million ways to die and it's by bomb scare and it's an animated video um it was originally live and let die but we'd never got permission from sony basically some guy who makes arbitrary decisions for what can and can't be used for sony without going through any proper channels they just straight up refuse even if it's a cover and it's a one, it's a Beatles tune, and two, it's James Bond, both of which I think are owned by Sony. Um, you know, they, they just say no. So we had to go and take, thankfully the whole album was Bond themed, so we took an instrumental called A Million Ways to Die from the same album, and then we had to extend another two minutes onto that animation. And if anyone's wondering, yes, it does take a long time. It took us a good four months at the start of the pan before the pandemic to actually do the original. We then got told we couldn't use it. So we then had to take the same animation and repurpose it with different shots to make it fit the new song. And thankfully, again, because the theme was right, there was some stuff that we'd explicitly done to make it fit the, the, the song, Let Him Let Die. Uh, but thankfully, we were able to translate it and add to it. And it took another few months of, of doing, but you're basically doing it in After Effects. It's 2D digital animation um just step by step just moving mask layers and stuff like that and just getting really ambitious with the backgrounds that sort of stuff and um, trying to do, use all these techniques to get it done faster and efficiently it basically it's that's how we started doing it and then eventually from that we learned how to do it properly like actually rigging a puppet they call it rigging a puppet so you could, we, we did a video for um yep a band called yep man y-i-p yep man and that was a song called dangling carrots and that actually required the character and that to be walking and singing which meant obviously because it's a lot easier to animate bodies and stuff like that but when you actually get into the you know mouth movements and stuff like that that's when it gets really really complicated now on that one uh, we used the assistance of Adobe um, Animator, Character Animate, um, and you can actually use your webcam to motion capture your face. And a lot of people do that just now with um, instructional videos for businesses, you know, or if, if you're wanting to have yourself as a little avatar or whatnot, you can actually use these um, pre-made um, uh, or you can even make your own face with it and as provided you have all the lip movements and whatnot the motion capture will actually uh, animate that head for you so you still have to do all the work in terms of the puppet rigging a puppet is basically making a different layer for every part of the body and then and then getting that to move independently it's not just one thing you're not hand drawing everything you're actually getting the the, the bits of the, the body to move so if you like have a layer here a layer here uh, a layer here, a layer here. You're just sort of animating all those things over and it's still very time consuming, but it's not like old, you know, cell animation that, that, that Disney did where basically every frame is hand drawn. This is basically, we draw the frame, but then we move it, we puppet it. We puppet it digitally using keyframes and after effects. And then the or one of the guys in the studio had to, not only program in all the little um, mouth movements, um, but you also had to sit there and sing the entire song um, because character animate works on a sound level, like it actually responds to the waveform, like the head movements and all that, all that is on motion cap, but the actual thing, it responds to not only the visual thing from the webcam, but also responds to the sound of what you're saying or singing. But because it's not very difficult, it's not very good at recognizing pitch, he had to sing the whole song monotone 
to actually get the mouth to do what we wanted it to do. So it's still very involved. It's not just a case of, you know, let's just motion cap it and stick it on there. You have to get the character right. You have to get the movement right. You have, you're, you're, you're watching old school animation videos to see how a character moves, you know, like how it jumps, how it puts its hands in the air, how it waves, how it plays guitar, all that stuff. Uh, but it's really interesting. And once you actually get into it, you know, it does actually go a lot quicker. Um, and again, it's just something that we we learned. Like that's one where I had to force myself to watch an hour long YouTube tutorial and just keep pausing it and step by step. So all of that, so you that that's and really getting the, the the method inside my head. So when the next time I do it, it's easier, and you're just constantly learning. But it's just the same as anything else. I like the fact that animating opens up a whole world of possibilities. If you're not using actual actors, you can actually make whatever you want appear on that screen. You can have your your your, your character doing all sorts of things. Um, uh, it, it, the only limit is your own imagination, really. And again, it's just something that we just happened onto and you know just learned. And you're wanting to get to A to B quicker. I want to get to telling the story as quick as possible. So when I first got a guitar, I wanted to learn at minimum two chords so I could start writing a song. When I got a camera, I wanted to learn enough about it um, and just write anything so I could put a story up on the screen. Um, I want to get to the emperor. That's why I, I, I tried being a novelist at one point, but that was never going to work because I never had the patience. <laughs> you know, it takes too long for you to get to the point where you're actually got it there. And that has both served me and hindered me because sometimes you need to put that, but it's part of the learning experience. You have to find your own style, but you know, I, I think it's very important to get an end product out there. Um, you know, you can't have a lot of unfinished products unless those products are, or projects are serving a purpose by teaching you and you didn't release it because it's not good enough, but you have to complete things. You have to get things, you have to scratch that itch. You have to get something from concept to reality as quick as possible. I mean, there's only like one or two projects that I'm still sitting on from years ago. And that's purely because it's out with my control. You have to, and again, this is to quote Film Riot, their whole mantra is write, shoot, edit, repeat. Mm -hmm. um, there is absolutely no substitute for experience. Um, and there's no such thing as bad experience. Um, you know, if it helps you become a better uh, creative, then it's not being wasted time. Oh, that's such a perfect note to end on, unless you yeah, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, it's interesting watching you going through that creative process to get the material, but how do you monetize it? In terms of actually like putting stuff up on YouTube and stuff how like that. You, how do you get people to give you money for it? Well, the, the jobs that we do, like in terms of like uh, a, our own passion projects and stuff like that, we'll probably never see any money for that. Um, okay. at Amazon, uh, you know, they pay their, 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 their rate, which I won't go into uh, for mm -hmm. shows that are on there that are submitted by, because basically Amazon is like, a more difficult to get onto YouTube because you need to have some of a certain level to get it on there. You know, it's not that like right. YouTube or just anything going there. You have to get to a certain spec um, to go through the Amazon uh, approval process, and that itself is like three weeks. You know, mm -hmm. and then if you've if they if they turn it down, then you need to go back and fix whatever it is, and then wait another three weeks. So that puts a lot of people off. So when you go to Amazon, are you going with just a script or are you going with a script and Finish. a trailer? Finished product, finished, finished product. product, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but going through Amazon Prime Video, uh, uh, like the, the, the way we did it is a submission process, whereas you know, mm -hmm. that's different from Amazon Studios, where they're actually um creating something of their own, and again, it's different mm -hmm. from you know, them taking on something that's like an established property. Like, for instance, if they wanted Peep Show, they would go through the production house that makes Peep Show and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. Amazon only accept long form content and uh, TV shows, they don't accept documentaries anymore, they don't accept short films. So they're very 
it is it's even dis- difficult for someone to cr- create something that actually fits that criteria you know nobody not a lot of people have like a tv series lying around not a lot of people have a feature film lying around tons of people have short films lying around or you know mm-hmm. un- unboxings of the latest xbox that sort of stuff which used to be on amazon but they don't accept that anymore so yeah we basically get you know the more people that watch it the more uh, we we get from that youtube again is the same anyone knows that you know youtube has now changed um so it's uh, you need to have a thousand subscribers or more i believe before you can even get monetized we're not even at that because i've never done what it takes i've been too interested even the, the, the get my website uh, up and running that's been like one of these things that i've been like oh because you're just you're so into the work you're so busy doing the mm-hmm. work i actually needed to get assistance from business gateway who because I was a new business, I qualified to get what's called a digital boost, where an expert actually, like, you know, essentially writes your website for you and you just put your own stuff on it. It takes an awful lot of time and you need someone around who, who's savvy about that to actually get you to the point where your content is actually gener- generating public interest and monetization, where I get my bread and butter. My, my bread and butter is basically uh, everything else is a passion project but I have to have fee paying clients um, to be able to afford to live because this is now my full time job. And at the right. moment it's word of mouth. So we get a lot of repeat business from that, but the, ideally I want to, you know, I want to be creatively focused, but now I'm business focused, you know, like I'm my, my, uh, where I get my money is from businesses who want to do promotional videos, who, you know, are bands that want to do animations, music videos, live events, yeah. live gigs, all that stuff. Uh, I'll even take jobs as a cameraman, you know, like I, I worked at COP26. Well, basically everybody in the industry worked at COP26. Like you, you couldn't, you, you couldn't actually like do all the jobs that were available um, at COP26 and um, stuff mm-hmm. like that. So that's where I get my income from. And then the hope is that uh, that frees me up Essentially, the, the business model that I have is I want to get enough business in to where as I can take a step back and have more of a supervisory role, which means that mm-hmm. I can concentrate because we want to have money coming in, but also want to, the reason we got that studio was to focus on our own creative endeavors. Right, okay. So getting the money, you basically do what you want to do. You do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do. Thanks, Andrew. Is there any more questions um, for Graham? Anyone? Cool. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you so, so much, Graham. It's been so inspiring. And, and um, yeah, um, I just love that everything you do just really feels like it comes from your gut. And I love that you're <laughs> just following that, you know? Um, but thank you so much. and. Um, we're, I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Sure. If uh, anyone wants to see more, you know, if we've actually, you can, we have a, got a couple of show deals on our website, uh, landinglightstudios.com. Um, uh, and uh, also we've got a YouTube channel there as well. And uh, anyone who hasn't seen Ouija's, it's available on Amazon uh, by searching Ouija's. Exactly. I have, um, that, I have to get that plug in there. Like. <laughs> no, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I did send the, the Instagram yesterday on the on the Teams group. But okay. there you go. Thank you so much, Gran. Have a Thanks for having day. me. And everyone, see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye now. Bye.